thermal resistance, we're going to call it R, is going to be equal to the difference, or the ratio between the temperature gradient and the heat flowing. So that'll be Kelvin over Watt will be the units. And this makes intuitive sense if you think about it. So let's go ahead and say we have a wall here, a nice vertical wall here. And on the left-hand side of the wall, we have a very, very hot temperature. And on the right-hand side of the wall, it's very cold. So that'll affect the numerator of this fraction. And we're going to give it a big box to represent a big numerical value. And despite this big temperature gradient, we're going to have very, very little heat flowing through, very little wattage. And we'll use a small box to represent the small numerical value. So we have a big temperature gradient, but very little heat flowing through. This would be ideal for a house, a good insulation situation going on. So because we know the heat flowing through and we know the temperature gradient, this a big number over a small number is going to represent a very big thermal resistance. And so the material here might be made out of straw bales. We could just have a very small wall, a very small area to heat for heat to flow through. Or we might have a very thick wall. So those are the three factors which affect thermal resistance, the area, the length, and the thermal conductivity of the material. So let's take the the other situation where we have, let's say we have a very hot material, very hot area here, and then a pretty hot area here. So we have a small temperature gradient, and yet despite the small temperature gradient, we have a lot of heat flowing through the wall. So small delta T and big Q. In this case, we would know that the thermal resistance of the wall is very small. It could be a very big wall for a lot of heat to flow through. It could be a very thin wall, so heat flows through well. Or it could have a very large thermal conductivity. It could be made out of copper or aluminum. So this would be an ideal situation for a heat exchanger where you want a very low thermal resistance. So we're going to derive thermal resistances for a couple common geometries. A plain wall, a cylinder, in this case we're looking straight down the tube, and then a sphere. So a plain wall, the kind of stuff, this is what you would use to model a house. So in this case we use Fourier's law. Actually for all three cases we're going to use Fourier's law. Which says that the the wattage this is in watts is equal to minus the thermal conductivity times the area times the temperature gradient. So what we do for each of these cases is we're going to solve, we're going to integrate Fourier's law using boundary conditions. Q is a constant, minus K is a constant, as well as the area area of the wall. They don't change with respect to temperature. K is not actually constant, but it's approximated as constant. And we can integrate with our boundary conditions. So for the wall here, this will be x1, this will be x2, and this will be t2, and this side of the wall we call t1. As you can see here, the integral here is pretty straightforward. x2 minus x1. And the same thing on the right-hand side. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch the temperatures and switch the side on the outside. And we can rewrite this just as delta t. And we're going to rewrite the difference in x as L. So L will be the length of the wall, or the length of our 
of what we're interested, what we would normally call the thickness of the wall. And remember, this is our definition for thermal resistance. So all we have to do is find dt over q, and we'll have it. dt is on the right-hand side. We're going to divide both sides by q. And we're going to divide both sides by thermal conductivity times area. And we are left for our thermal resistance of a plain wall as dt over q equals length divided by thermal resistance times area. And that's the definition of thermal resistance for a plain wall. So for a cylinder here, again, we have Fourier's law, only the area does change with respect to radius. The circumference in this circle here is going to be 2 pi times r. That'll give you this area here. And then we multiply by length to get the area in meters squared because this is a three-dimensional object. So this will be the area, 2 pi r times length. So again, we just go ahead and we re rewrite this. We divide this side by r and we multiply both sides by dr. Just like that. And then we'll keep the constants over here. And again, these four terms are considered constant. R is not considered a constant. That should be just R in the numerator here, not dr. So we integrate from R1. So the fluid on the inside would be T1 at R1. And on the outside, you would have T2. This would be the temperature of the outside air. We take the integral. It's going to be the natural log of R2 minus the natural log of R1. And the right-hand side is the same. I'm just going to write it as delta T right now and have switch the sign. Same thing I did in the previous problem. Again, we just solve for delta T over Q to get R equals divide both sides by K times 2 pi times L. And divide both sides by Q. So the numerator, we're going to simplify this natural log expression to be the natural log of the ratios that is a property of logarithms and that we have just utilized times k times l and this is the thermal resistance of a cylinder this is the surface area of a sphere and so this is the the corresponding fourier's law multiply both sides by r to the minus 2 and dr so on this side, and we perform the integration just like we did in the previous two problems. This would be the inner shell and this would be the outer shell, outer shell the, their respective radii. So these, these would cancel out here and we have four pi times dt and we integrate with the corresponding temperatures. <clears throat> so the integral here will look like a minus Q times one over R2 minus one over R1. Which will be one over R1 minus one over R2 if we switch the signs here. And as in the previous two problems, I'm going to skip those steps because we already went through those. So we can simplify this expression by getting a common denominator. Multiply the left fraction by R2 over R2 and the right fraction by R1 over R1. And so we've got a common denominator here of R2 times R1.
just like that equals four pi times delta t. And we have all our values here, so we just divide out, do the appropriate algebra, and we can get our thumb resistance of R2 minus R1 times four divided by four pi R1 times R2. And um, one thing I've forgotten here is the K. So in each of these terms, you see from Fourier's law, K is included. So it'd be minus four pi times K and on the right hand side. So this K would have been with the four pi in each one of these terms and will just be divided. So I apologize for that, but I hope uh, that didn't make it too confusing. It's just, it's considered a constant, so it's not included in any of the integration. And so this will be the thumb resistance for a cylinder right here. And so those are three common geometries. I don't know if this one's as common, but just keep in mind that this is the conductive resistance for a material, and that's, that's one part of the circuit. There's also the convection coefficient, and we'll go over how to find those a little bit later, but it's, it's not as um, analytical. It's usually just empirical data, and I don't know, it's not as beautiful and cool. It's a lot uglier, but we'll go over that later, and thanks for watching.